Gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu, miliarbus, et benedictus fructus ventus tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris, Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the Immunity of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome once again to the Terror of Demons morning show. Joined as always by co-host Kennedy Hall. How you doing, brother? Living the dream. How about you? Excellent. I love your background. It's, can you tell us about that? It's the yeah. flag of Quebec, right? It was for a time. There was a, uh, a strong Quebec uh, Catholic nationalist movement, and it's uh, Le Carillon de Sacre Coeur. So, if you can see there, is that with Duplessis? Oh, this is before him. Oh, really? I mean, uh, some of it would have been contemporary to his time in politics, but it started, I believe, in the early 1900s. That's right. And um, Very yeah, good. so uh, it's uh, Sacred Heart and Maple Leafs and stuff. It's pretty cool. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. excellent. Well, welcome to the ninth Sunday, the ninth week after Pentecost. Today is the Feast of Saint Anne. Uh, we also have, um, let's see, Saint. Uh, lots of great early martyrs this week. Um, also, the great Saint Ignatius of Loyola, one yeah. of the Jesuits, the original. Uh, crusader of that period, the, back when the Jesuits had the crusading zeal, and they took the gospel throughout the world with the spirit of Saint Ignatius. So today we're going to talk about Lefebvre versus Ratzinger on the liturgy. We are going to be focusing on the liturgy, talking more and more about this topic because it is critical, as we know. And but this week, uh, Kennedy, what's going on with the Kennedy profession? Oh yeah, Monday to Friday, three to six. Um, go to crusadechannel.com forward slash Kennedy. And, um, well, we've got a variety of things going on this week. Um, we're doing a study on liberalism is a sin. So part of the show is the last segment, uh, roughly the last segment of the show. So the last half hour. So yeah, there you go. Um, we actually, we actually partnered with 10 books. So, oh, sweet. So, uh, basically, you know, for the last segment of every show, we call it study hall, you know, play on the whole last name, Kennedy Hall, et cetera. And um, we go over a, a, a book, either philosophical, historical, theological, whatever. And um, we just kind of go through it, you know, almost like a book study. Way to, and uh, Because also, too, uh, uh, people are going to be listening to this show. They do listen to the show kind of on their way home from work, et cetera. So um, we do go over a lot of news and politics, all that sort of stuff. But then we sort of try to have something ed um, edifying at the end of the show. You know, you, you hear something and not that the rest of the show isn't edifying, but you know what I'm saying. Something uh, it's good for reading. Yeah, it's more. Yeah, more intellectual, etc. I'd sort of finish the show off. So we're going through that, and then um, there's a bunch of uh, stuff going on right now in uh, the political world. That um, what's his name, Larry Elder? He's that famous conservative uh, uh, talk radio host. He's running for governor in California, and he's coming out as extremely pro-life, which is interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of developments with uh, what's going on with uh, the certain respiratory illness on everybody's mind uh, going on there. CDC has changed their guidelines again for something that uh, it's kind of suspicious. And a um, bunch of things going on internationally with uh, passports and so forth that uh, seem to be causing lots of unrest in Europe, which we're going to talk about. And then we've got a slew of guests that we're hoping to get on as well. Sweet. That's excellent. So sign up today, Crusade Channel. All of the links are below. We have um, the, uh, yes, the Crusade, the link to join the new Crusade, 
which is the Kennedy profession, is below. We also have the Mass of the Ages documentary coming up. This is very critical. Mm-hmm. Go sign up right now. It's theliturgy.org. This, the, uh, there are three episodes. The first episode is uh, releasing in just a couple of weeks, August 15, on the Feast of the Assumption. And this documentary is going to, I, I, I'm so excited because it's, it's the perfect time. Motu Proprio came out. Uh, it's, it's not the secular media is talking about the Latin Mass. Now that we're going to have a yeah. documentary on the Latin Mass. If you can, if you have any means, please donate because they're just trying to, the, the final push of the marketing campaign to get, to get it really distributed around the world. It's going to be great. So what, please, what, how are they going to release it? Is it going to be like you pay for, pay the website to watch it? It's, it is going to be free. So you can oh. watch it for free, the liturgy.org. And then the disp- the distribution is going to be in various means. So, hmm. um, but there's enough money to, to release it for free. So this is going to be great. Um, yeah, it's going to be excellent. I should get more information so I can promote this with all the details. But go to the liturgy.org for all of the details. Um, let me see. Let me just go on that website. So you have to get the you have to sign up for the, on their uh, on their mailing list, um, and then you should be able to get notified with all of the details. Um, and then you can pay extra to get all the full interviews, which are like the uncut versions, basically. Hmm. Uh, so then you get a behind, behind the scenes and stuff. Yeah. So, but but There's this also- is a very worthy thing to be <laughs> to be uh, donating to 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 promote this at this time. So please donate. There's also a new um, uh, addendum to the biography of Marcel Lefebvre coming out. Uh, oh, really? Interesting. Called the, called the rest of the story. Oh, okay. And uh, written by Bishop uh, Malloray, DCA. And uh, I think it's available for pre-order. They've been sending around emails in the, uh, you know, the parish. We've been getting emails. And uh, it looks pretty interesting. Um, there's, I mean, there's obviously so much more to his life. And... Um, uh, lots of questions sort of people have still about certain things with the with his with what happened and so it'll be interesting to read i'm actually really excited um because uh it's it's not as big as the other one i think it's it's maybe half as thick or something but if you've read his uh, you have but for people that have i mean you know there's tens of thousands of footnotes in the other one it's a very well cited book academic work yes it's good and so i would imagine the same level of scholarship is in the upcoming one so it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the story is because there's lots that maybe i don't know Excellent. Yeah, that, that's great. As we try to emphasize, we're, we're discussing Lefebvre, Ratzinger, jo, uh, Carol Wojtyla. If anybody wants to criticize any of these men, you need to first read their biographies, read their writings, and interpret them as sympathetically as possible, seeing them as the best light as we can through charity, and only coming to a negative view if we have serious evidence of that, as we have stated with Bunini, and we'll talk about. So, Without any further ado, uh, let's get into our topic. Um, so it is, what is the liturgy? And this, we're going to try to get at the some of the fundamental principles of the liturgy. And the first context of this is the Protestant revolt. And I want to just read some of the basic canons of Trent. Because the Protestants hated the Mass. They all hated the Mass. In fact, um, Davies, this great quote from Davies in his book, Cramner, the godly or this is That's this an amazing is book. important text that you have to read if you want to study the liturgy and what's going on to, in in the in the world right now in the catholic yeah. church it's this actually is an critical. incredible read almost as a yeah, story it's critical to read this text because this lays the whole context of everything that's going on because mm-hmm. the protestant revolt happens and all the protestants hate the mass because the mass is a sacrifice mm-hmm. and because their false theology of salvation by faith alone they believe that one cannot work out one's salvation with fear and trembling, as St. Paul says. Mm-hmm. And uh, we are not saved by grace working through charity, as St. Paul says. They want to, they've got their heresies. So they hate the Mass because the Mass is seen as a work in a participation in the sacrifice of Christ. And th- so the idea of the sacrifice of the Mass is an abomination to them. They think that they're adding to the sacrifice of, they're misunderstanding what the theology is. And they think that the mass is adding to the sacrifice of Christ. And, but what the mass actually is, is a participation in the sacrifice of Christ. Yep. And so there is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which has infinite merit. 
And then the sacrifice of the mass is making present what is eternal in, in the high priesthood of, as, as St. Paul says in the book of Hebrews, or the uh, epistle of the Hebrews, uh, he has entered into the heavenly tabernacle. The sacrifice of the cross is the sacrifice also of the heavenly tabernacle because it is the, hev- it is the Logos incarnate. It is the Logos incarnate offering his, himself in the sacrifice of the cross. Yeah. Right. Plus, well, plus um, St. Paul says, Romans, I think, I provide what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ, you know, yes, uh, obviously nothing's lacking in the infinite sense. Uh, what does that mean? Well, just on a basic level, um, that means we have to participate. Uh, you know, that means at least even outside of the liturgy, just on the basic level, um, if St. Paul is going to say something is lacking, well, clearly what's lacking, well, it can't be anything on his behalf, but for, let's say the potential of what Christ has done, uh, what's lacking is our participation therein. So uh, just on a basic level of uniting ourselves with the continuing and ongoing um, redemption that is offered to us, um, the Mass can clearly fit into that reality. Yeah, so it's, that's Colossians 1.24. Right. Yeah, now I rejoice in my sufferings and fill up in my body yeah. what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. So yeah. the idea is that the the body is the or the the church is the mystical mm-hmm. body of Christ. Christ is the head, we are the body. And so we participate in what the head does in the sense that there Christ has has completed all work on the cross and now he com, he applies that work to us. Mm-hmm. And we participate in his work. So it's all his work. Which point. which points the which points yeah. the fact that there's an application like that that's the that's the re, that's the point of, of his work to us that's what the sacrifice of the mass is, exactly. it is the sacrifice of the cross made present here today it is mm-hmm. going to calvary you're going to calvary every time you go to the mass you go literally you are literally going to calvary every time you go to the mass that's yes. that's the key point but it's literal in a sacramental way because that's why when your children are screaming and gyrating when you're trying to walk up to holy communion <laughs> yeah, you have they to know what's going on suffering. you have to have some suffering to offer up or else it's not calvary so you have you, that's what we need to understand about the the holy sacrifice of the mass is that you're going to Calvary every time you go to the mass, and that's why the mass is a sacrifice, and it's a propitiatory sacrifice sacramentally, mm-hmm. meaning it's applying that same propitiatory sacrifice in time. So it's p- applying an eternal reality to time. Yes, it's applying. It's basically governing all time because. Uh, the sacrifice is is outside time, even though it happened in time under Pontius Pilate, but it's applying to every single time. Every time you offer the mass, you are applying that eternal reality to this time. So let me read these uh, canons for the Council of Trent. Sure. Uh, this is from, let's see, third, session 22, uh, chapter 9. Uh, canon one, if anyone says that the in the mass a true and real sacrifice is not offered to God or that it be offered is not, or that to be offered is nothing else than that Christ has given to us to eat, let him be anathema. If anyone says that the sacrifice of the Mass is one only of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is a mere commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory one, or that it profits him only who receives and ought not to be offered for the living and the dead, for sins, punishments, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. If anyone says that the canon of the mass is, contains errors and is therefore to be abrogated let him be anathema there's another key uh if anyone says that s- the ceremonies vestments are not worth signs which the catholic church uses in the celebration of the masses are insensitive incentives to impiety rather than stimulants to piety let him be anathema if anyone says that the masses in which the priest alone communicates sacramentally are illicit and are therefore to be abrogated let him be anathema if anyone says that the right of the roman church according to which the part of the canon and the words of consecration are pronounced in a low voice is to be condemned or that the mass ought to be celebrated in the vernacular only let him be anathema so this is the protestants hated the sacrifice so they wanted they wanted to turn it into the lord's supper was their idea this is they said this is merely about the community coming together to remember christ's sacrifice and celebrate that thing that happened long ago all of that in and of itself is good unless you use it to abolish the sacrifice of the mass, because this, this is the key point that 
that we're going to discuss here is that the, the 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 sacrifice of the mass, the sacrificial content of it in the participation, Christ's own sacrifice is the most important thing to to do above all in the mass. Hmm. It's God's the worship of God. This is so this is here's the first principle: the worship of God above all else. That is the first and and only end of the mass in the sense that it's the only end. It's so infinite that it's it, it can be any everything else can be dispensed with. So that's why it says that if the priest alone communicates, the Protestants didn't like that because they wanted to make the Lord's Supper into this communal banquet. So that it's the worship of God above all else. And I wanted to read the doctor of the church of the 20th century, in my opinion, Dietrich von Hildebrand, mm -hmm. to explain this in his book, Liturgy and Personality. This, so this is in 1933, and he articulates this beautifully. He says that, at page two, he says, the liturgy is not primarily intended as a means of sanctification or an ascetic experience. Right. Its primary intention is to praise and glorify God to respond fittingly to him. The Holy Mass must never be offered with the sole intent of participating in its graces. The intention of adoring God and sacrifice to him through Christ with Christ and in Christ is the true condition for renewed incorporation in Christ and increase of grace. So I just want to, um, that's written in 1933. Um, people have to understand that the entire trajectory of the mass after the second Vatican council is completely in contrast to the understanding of what the liturgy ought to be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to get to that. We will, but I just want to say what you say, um, primarily not for the sanctification and participation. Funny enough, we talked to somebody who's from the Eastern Orthodox Church, which I'm sure you have, but a friend of mine, uh, he was kind of joking one time how it was so common uh, at his parish that like men would be coming in and out and like having a cigarette or like women would be coming in and out because liturgy is like two and a half, three hours long sometimes. But he was, he was joking at the point where they recognized that it was just the priest is taking care of the whole thing and he's offering the sacrifice and then they pray accordingly essentially and recognize it's not something of their own doing that's something that's just very hard for us to understand now is that it's the priest that's doing something that is beyond us um and we participate in that but we don't uh but it's not for us in the sense that we've been told it is that was yeah yeah, yeah. So, so exactly. So von Hillebrand goes on and he says, this is essentially, so this is the essence of sacrifice and charity and love. Because when you love God, you forget yourself. Yeah. Just adoring God, period. That's it. You, and, and then he says, um, were this act of beholding values, that's his philosophical terminology to, to basically, uh, behold the face of God and respond fittingly to him, just the adoration of God. He says, if this were to become a means of attaining transformation, at that very moment, it would cease to be a genuine irradiation of values and they no longer would be taken in their proper seriousness. They would no longer be a true communion with the world of values and the deep transformation would thus be halted. So what Hildebrand is trying to say here is, that the whole transformation of the individual personal soul in Christ at the mass takes place because we're focusing on God above all else. Yeah. As soon as we start to take the liturgy and we focus that, we start to figure out a way to focus on man mm -hmm. and focus on his sanctification and, and his education and his whatever, we lose the primary focus, which is the worship of God. And that in and of itself is what actually transforms man. So by, by forgetting yourself in the liturgy, by worshiping God above all else, that's how you actually transform man. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of ironic. I don't know if that's, <laughs> should we, we're using the term properly here, but it's ironic because if you start to turn and focus on man and his sanctification, then you lose the sanctification. But if you focus on God above all else, then you actually do have the sanctification. That's, that's the what, principle. It's what Chesterton says about um, why uh, nature worship is unnatural. He says, the moment you start to worship nature, it becomes unnatural. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's not the purpose of it is the point. Yeah, somebody's asking in the chat. So this is Liturgy and Personality is the English title. It's a German text written in 1933 mm -hmm. by Dietrich von Hildebrand. Which, if he's writing that in 1933, it shows you uh, what's already on the mind of people. Uh, what's, it's, a, it's a 
debated topic among intellectuals is the purpose of liturgy, which obviously the Second Vatican Council didn't jump out of nowhere. And also you can find even with uh, Bishop Carroll, the famous American bishop who was excommunicated from Quebec <laughs> um, <clears throat> and friends with Jefferson, Jefferson, I believe. Um, he was actually a proponent of uh, the vernacular. That was already something going on at that time. Um, it was a debate amongst, uh, uh, obviously, if it's, it's something that he was thinking about, it, he wasn't the only one. So this is not a new phenomenon. It's been something that's been hotly debated back and forth between uh, bishops and prelates for hundreds of years. Yeah, and so, and we want to balance this by giving the context of the liturgical movement, which was after the French Revolution, the destruction, uh, Guéranger, the French abbot, in oh, yeah. Yeah. there was a there was basically a a rediscovery of the liturgical text and the greatness of the liturgy in and of itself in terms of the text of the liturgy the proper celebration of the liturgy and this was so the the greatest thing was the liturgical movement was saying the liturgy is so spectacularly uh, exquisite and high in its in its prayer and its common prayer we want to help the faithful participate yeah. more in all of this. So the, and so when you go to a Latin mass and you have a missile, yeah. that is a fruit of the liturgical movement. Missiles it's actually, it's actually a novelty historically. Speaking. It's actually a novelty. Yeah. So yeah. so there is a sense that we do want there can sort of be ex, an extreme form of the, this first principle. We're talking about the worship of God above all else, the sacrifice of the mass. But you know, if there is an extreme form where you're saying like, you know, the, the faithful should not participate whatsoever. They shouldn't follow them. Like, I'm not going to tell you what the liturgy even says or anything like that. That would be an extreme form of that because then you're you're not bringing anything out. But on the other hand, there's an extreme on the other side, which we'll get to, which happened. Um, so there is a sense that we do because after the worship, worship of God is safeguarded above all else. Mm -hmm. And we've got that in the celebration of the mass and in the theology of the mass. If we have that totally in place, then we can turn to the faithful and say, okay, I want to tell you about this prayers at the foot of the altar. What is this? What is he saying? What does it mean? The, the text, uh, this text, uh, this is the text of by Guéranger, the Holy Mass. This is the text that just goes through the Mass. And this is an awesome text just to read on the Latin Mass, um, where he just goes through all the texts of the mass and talks about it and talks about what it means. And it, so this is the type of thing we're talking about. If, if we got the, the worship of God above all else, and then we have, then we can deal with the faithful. So mm -hmm. let's get into Lefebvre and Ratzinger. So what's the reason I wanted to talk about this was that I was studying for, um, studying this. And I, I was very struck by the fact that, the fundamental principles and concerns of Ratzinger and Lefebvre are actually identical. Yep. I, I was very surprised to find this out on these fundamental principles. So I, I'm going to read from biography of Marcel Lefebvre. And this is on, let's see, let me make sure I've got, I've said everything. I, I wrote an outline because I had all these citations. Um, we went to, okay. So basically this is from page two, 277 of Lefebvre biography. And this is when they're discussing Bunini's schema. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, I should read uh, Chiron. Where is that? Here it is. So, <clears throat> Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document from Vatican II, was a draft that was written by Bunini. Bunini wrote the draft to Sacrosanctum Concilium. And in his in his most recent biography, his only biography, on page eighty two, it talks about a meeting that he had while drafting this document, the document of Sacrosanctum Concilium. And in this meeting, Bunini tells his uh, tells the other people who are drafting it how he designed this document. So here's a quote from the biography, which is quoting his uh, his meeting on October 11, 1961. So this is before Vatican II. It says this. This is Bunini talking. It would be most inconvenient for the articles of our constitution to be rejected by the Central Commission or by the Council itself. That is why we must tread carefully and discreetly, carefully so that proposals be made in an acceptable manner, or in my opinion,
formulated in such a way that much is said without seeming to say anything. Let many things be said in embryo, in Nuce, he says, and in this way, let the door remain open to legitimate and possible post-conciliar deductions and applications. Let nothing be said that suggests excessive novelty and might invalidate all the rest, even what is straightforward and harmless. We must proceed discreetly. Not everything is to be asked or demanded from the council, but the essentials, the fundamentals, the principles. I can't so, stand the way these guys talk. <laughs> well, Brunini, so what's clear from this is that Brunini designed the text of Sacrosanctum Concilium to be acceptable to the council, mm -hmm. but to contain the fundamental principles that would allow him to create a brand new mass mm -hmm. that we had with the, the Nova Soro Misa. So this is where we get into the distinction we made a couple weeks ago between the, the historical intention of the council and the ontological intention, intention of the council, because Bunini intended to uh, implement the hermeneutic of rupture yep. with this document. He wanted to rupture because when you make a mass that only has 40 percent of the, the prayers from they had before, that's that's a rupture. And we'll talk about how I, I think that Ratzinger, when he talks about rupture, he's actually talking about the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And I, I will give proof of that in in this show or subsequent shows. Um, so Bunini designs the text in order to create a brand new mass. So he has something in mind that the bishops did not even have in mind when they approved the document. And then after the council, Paul VI, so Paul VI gives everything over to Bunini. He gives him his complete confidence. He defends him against all these critics. But then after 1970, the comp, his Paul VI's confidence in Bunini starts to erode. And he starts to realize that Bunini lied to him. We'll talk about that, that he deceived everybody. And eventually he sacks Bunini and sends him to Iran in 1995. Yeah. And Paul VI starts to try to reverse everything he did. In 1975, he investigates the Curia, tries to clamp down a community in the hand, et cetera, et cetera. So we're getting to that. But so Lefebvre, so this is the context. So Lefebvre is a key player. He's the mainstream trusted Here's the thing about Lefebvre is that he is the mainstream archbishop trusted by the Vatican since the 50s. He's he's famous. You know, the, the popes trusted him. So he's put by John the 23rd. He's put on one of the preparatory commissions for Vatican II. So this is during the preparatory commission where they're reviewing these schema, these schemata. So they take. So this is this is a meeting. This is a record of a meeting with Lefebvre and a few other bishops. And they're just preparing the text for Vatican II. So 277, they read this text of Bunini, and the Archbishop Lefebvre says this. So I'm just quoting, I'll just quote from the, the biography. Archbishop Lefebvre himself denounced the definition of the liturgy, quoting Lefebvre, the definition of the liturgy, which seems incomplete because the sacramental and sanctifying aspects are giving more emphasis on the aspect of prayers not emphasized enough. The fundamental aspect of the liturgy is the worship given to God, an act of religion, end quote. So that's exactly what we were just saying, is that the so the, the final text of Sacrosanctum Concilium says contradictory things on this point. It says, on the one hand, uh, it says the, the participation of the faithful is the reform that should be considered above all else. That's the phrase it uses. So above all else, we should be participating in the faithful. But that, that's impossible be, to be taken in sort of an ontological sense, because as we said, the sacrifice of the mass is the worship of God above all else. Mm -hmm. Because in Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph seven, it says that the liturgy is the action of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the that's true. A, a, a more clear understanding of the liturgy. It is the action of Christ, not the action of the faithful per se. It is the action of Christ, period. The faithful can then participate in the action of Christ at the liturgy. This is something that people need to understand when um, when they're trying to assess the documents Second Vatican Council. This is why uh, you can, on the one hand, while well, you can hold two competing ideas, on the one hand, you can say yes, it's a validly convoked council, it followed the procedures of a council, a meeting of the bishops, communion with the Pope, and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's theoretically possible. Uh, that most of the documentation could be seen as being orthodox. But uh, when there's a lack of clarity, uh, the lack of clarity itself is extremely dangerous uh, 
uh, because the point, uh, essentially, the point of a council historically has been to clarify something that's a debate amongst the faithful, amongst the bishop, the the, the 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 prelates, and so forth. Because clarity, for better or for worse, I mean, you know, it's almost better to have something clear and uh, you don't agree with it, but it's like, well, that's clearly the direction we're going in, uh, because it gives you something to hang your hat on. Um, so. When bishops like Lefebvre uh, and others, and he wasn't the only one who protested, but he sort of was in a, in a position to protest it publicly. Um, they looked at these documents and they said, eh, I mean, there's a sense that we can understand it properly, um, but there's a sense that we can't. And that's why it's always been called the time bombs. So sure, you look at the council in the 1960s, you go, well, okay, as long as we kind of stick to our goals and things and we can be fine. But you recognize later that just like Bonini is admitting that there's something baked into the cake, which means that later on, when the uh, uh, fruits are the fruits come to fruition, then you'll realize that was the intent of it. Um, so it's possible for someone to look at the council and say, uh, "I will sign these documents." But it's also possible for someone to look at how it turned out later on and say, "There's a problem here. I have to almost renounce my, my former support." It's not a contradiction. It's not a hypocritical thing. It's just it's just built into the nature as Bunidi admits himself. So let me just read two quotes from Sacra Santum Concilia. Uh, on this very point. So it says, uh, paragraph 33, although the sacred liturgy is above all things, the worship of the divine majesty. Yep. Okay. That's what we're trying to say. Above all things, it is the worship of the divine majesty. Exactly. Fair enough. It then says, it likewise contains much instruction for the faithful. And I believe, I think this is quoting Trent, because the Trent, Trent considers this as well. It says that it does contain much instruction for the faithful at, at Trent, but then they decide not to do the vernacular at that time because the fathers didn't do vernacular. Um, but then Sacrosanctum Concilium, paragraph 14. Now listen to this. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebration, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people uh, as a right and duty, etc. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else. Okay, so first, and that actually it was later, later in the document, they say it's the worship of the divine majesty before all else. But now in this other place, they're saying the the to participation by all the people should be considered before all. Well, and it's also vague because it's, it's the aim to be considered. You know, yeah. So, so, it, so, yeah. The, so let's talk about. So here's where we get into these distinctions. So historically, I think we can say Bunini intended this document to make to basically turn around everything, turn around the altars, make this a communion service or whatever. Yeah. He, he intended these words to be implied to be applied that way on a historical level, but on an ontological level, it is impossible that an, that an ecumenical council can reverse the ends of mass because those are ontologically a part of the nature of the sacrifice. You, you can't, you, you cannot change that. It's the worship of Almighty God above all else, period. Uh, so the only way to understand this is to say that, what is meant by that is we are trying to reform the liturgy to simply add more participation of the faithful so that they can participate in that first and final end of, of uh, worship of Almighty God. Which so theoretically we have, to, is we have to reconcile these two passages. I'm, I'm not asserting I'm not asserting here that this is a real contradiction. We have to reconcile them properly, but because there is some sort of a ambiguity, Bunini can then use his use his own ideas. Well, and it does, and they don't define what it means for the, the faithful to be uh, formed or educated, because uh, anyone who's gone from the Novus Ordo for years, let's say, and then you get recalibrated, it almost takes about three or four months. You go to the traditional mass exclusively. Um, you realize how much you learned by just being at traditional mass, because you learn for the first time, almost from an osmosis perspective, that this is a sacrifice uh, in the truest sense of the word. Um, not just intellectually, but in its very essence. Um, so yes, you are formed at the liturgy. There are things, the the old mass, so-called, does teach the faithful uh, by the very act of being there and, and, and every single aspect of the liturgy. You know, even just why is it, why is the epistle read on one side versus the gospel on the other? Um, why are the postures of the priest a certain way? 
Why are the bells rung at certain times? Why are his fingers a certain way? I mean, all of these things, you go there long enough, you see these things, and almost as if God uh, was in charge of the church or something, uh, you actually learn things through just witnessing what actually happens in the liturgy. And we have to understand as well that um, obviously many people have been literate for a long time, but the general mass of people were not literate for a long period of time. Um, Although today they're probably not even more literate than they were in a, in a practical sense, if you think about how dumb people are with uh, lots of things. Um, so clearly, it wasn't as if until 1965, uh, the faith were like, I've never, I don't know anything about mass. I, I've never heard of this before. I just kind of go there and it's over my head. You know, clearly there were ways to instruct the faithful and the mass itself organically, the growth of the Holy Ghost working in the church, instructs the faithful by them being there. So again, you can reformed liturgy in a way that instructs the faithful. It's just that this whole idea of instructing the faithful has been co-opted as almost, uh, you know, the mass has to turn into a Bible study and a lecture, uh, which was never the aim. And it's not even, it's not even uh, evident that would ever be um, uh, effective anyway, because there's no precedent for it. Uh, yeah. Um, so in the context, um, and, and Lefebvre was in favor of reform itself so yeah. i the the in that initial meeting that i quoted from he actually voted for the document with reservations yeah so he he was saying yes yes to reform no to revolution is the way the yeah. biography puts it but the context of sacred sanctum concilium 14 is really talking about liturgical devotions that's what they're really talking about so you can take i i I don't want to take these two sort of contradictions out of context because there's an apparent contradiction, but it's not a real contradiction because in context in 14, they're talking about liturgical devotions. So Sacrum Sanctum Concilium on an ontological level, again, not Bunini's historical intentions, but on an ontological level, the church is trying to bring the faithful to a greater appreciation of the liturgy instead of praying the rosary at mass or praying your prayers at mass at the mass but actually using your missile at mass. And that's what most people do today. Yeah. So people need, Latin mass people need to understand that this is also the fruit of Sacrum Sacrum Concilium. The fact that you use a missile at mass, the fact that most people do that and don't pray the rosary. So, but I will also, on a side, I will say that the, the rosary is also very fruitful at mass too. I, I it's actually a, a devotion that I prefer at mass is, is to pray the rosary. But, um, but the fact the, the point is that they're trying to make is that the act, the participation of the faithful in the liturgy is, is try is what they're trying to to achieve with the reform. Now Lefebvre did he was in favor of reform. Here's page here's page three thirty. In uh, June of nineteen sixty five, uh, quoting from the biography, he tried Lefebvre tried to find a productive middle way for the reforms that were taking place and asked himself, would the line be found? He recognized a very clear distinction between the first part of the mass or the mass of the catechumens and the properly sacrificial part, which began at the offertory. And then now quoting from Lefebvre, Lefebvre says, the first part of the mass, which was designed to instruct the faithful, needed to attain its objectives more clearly. So let the priest be near the faithful, communicate with them, pray and sing with them, stand at the lectern, say the collect in their language, and also the readings of the epistle and the gospel. And then, end quote, Archbishop Lefebvre, say, this, here's the biography talking, Archbishop Lefebvre wanted the second part of the mass to be said at the altar. He also wanted to be said in Latin in a low voice. The prelates broad views, etc. He considered that the readings of the sermon were indispensable in preparing the faithful for the sacrifice. Naturally, the offertory and the canon remained the impregnable bastion of that sacrifice. So there is a, uh, the, we, we do the Latin, we do the readings in Latin as a worship of God. That's yeah. that, the purpose of Latin because they're read for the living and the dead. Yeah. So it's not just for the living, it's also for the dead. And they can understand Latin. And it's also just a worship of God. Mm. But there is still a sense of, of pray, reading the readings and reading the collects and all that. So Lefebvre is not against here. He's not against the vernacular per se. And obviously there's, there's, there is a precedent for a sacred vernacular as opposed to a, a profane vernacular that we have in the new mass today. There is a sacred vernacular like St. Cyril and Methodius who took a sacred, an existing sacred language, a sacred antique version of the language that existed and translated things into Slavonic and whatnot. Yeah, I was going to say Slavonic, but also I would I would add 
when we're talking about reform, what we're talking about is essentially adaptation to the circumstances so that we can better articulate what is necessary for salvation. Essentially, that's kind of what a reform would be, no matter what, whatever you were trying to reform in the church, that's a useful way of looking at it. So uh, when you read Lefebvre's biography, for example, it was in the 19... 19- 50s late 50s was it when they started having uh evening mass like with the, when the uh basically yes. yeah so here's the thing you live in a society that at one time was christendom and then now is not christendom so uh there was a time you know read the biography of sister lucy for example uh, or just the, the story of fatima from uh, uh, thomas walsh and um you would be catechized, you know, you, you look back on the old uh, uh, relationships that parish priests would have with their village and so on and so forth. Um, the priest would be catechizing. Uh, there would be, you know, the mothers would be trained by the priest to catechize the children, essentially working in conjunction, how to understand the scriptures and so on and so forth. This was like a part of life is, is this whole um, reality of instructing the faithful. Catechesis was seen as first education and so on. This changes because many things change in society. Schooling changes, work changes. Uh, you don't live in a you live in a world where they don't really care about your Catholic rhythms of life. So it's not as if you're going to Vespers and things as often as you'd like. It's not as if um, even your school is, is, is teaching you the faith anymore because that might be illegal literally in some places. Uh, you also might be in mission territory like Lefebvre. I mean, Africa has only been Catholic for roughly, you know, Sub-Saharan for roughly 200 years or something, you know, for the most part, depending on where you are. And, um, so uh, it's a useful it's a useful development that you would have the readings in, in your vernacular at Mass and have a sermon that's instructful or in, instruct, instructing at Mass. Um, because uh, this might be the only time of the week where lots of people, they may have personal devotions, rosaries, got the statues in the house, praying novenas and all that sort of thing. But as far as can we be instructed while you're living in an industrial age at this point where so-and-so works at a factory or whatever, um, uh, this is a time where we will actually teach you the Catholic faith while you're at mass. Therefore, the vernacular is important. That's a useful development. I, I appreciate that. I mean, obviously, I'm lucky that you and I, we get to sort of do this work and hobby sort of thing where we're learning our faith and, and make something out of it. But for a lot of people, it's not the case. You know, you work at a Ford plant or something like that for 10 hours a day. Uh, you're commuting and so forth, especially before the advent of audiobooks and podcasts and things. So you go to mass on Sunday and you learn about your Catholic faith as well. That's a useful development. Hence why it's something that could be encouraged by, uh, you know, a so-called traditionalist, but with reform. Um, uh, but you can also turn that into, again, the liturgy, the, the mass becomes a time for going through a, a, a you know, a Bible study conference, which is not the point. Yeah. The, and this is the key that, uh, traditionalists need to understand is that the idea of an unchanging mass forever is not traditional. That's not traditional no. at all. That's Orthodox, actually. It's Eastern Orthodox. That's what they do with their liturgy after they became schismatic. they never changed their liturgy whatsoever. And so there, there is a, there is an organic development of the liturgy read, uh, Elkwin read organic development of the liturgy. That's the one you've got to read for that. It's important. Um, so Lefebvre was in favor of some reform, but what happened was that Bunini imposed his will by lying and manipulating. So what he would do was he had, he had the concilium, which was, which was in charge of imposing the new mass. And he, wanted to impose his will. So he said to the concilium, well, we're going to do X, Y, Z. And the concilium was like, whoa, 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 that's way too far. And then he said, well, the Pope said it. Pope said it, you have to, and they, okay, they said, okay, fine. But that was a lie. And then he went back to Paul VI and said, well, Paul VI, uh, Holy Father, we the concilium wants to do X, Y, Z. And Paul VI said, whoa, 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 that's, that's way too far. And then he said, well, the concilium is unanimous. We've all agreed, but that was a lie. Mm-hmm. So this is how he did it. And we know this because Louis Bouillet, who was a part of the concilium, he wrote a memoir where he he actually talked to the Holy Father, uh, to Paul VI, and, and Paul VI came to him. This was after this reform. So the reform comes out, 1969, Paul VI, he, he defends Bunini against all his critics. He imposes the new mass. The new mass rep has 17 to 40% of the original prayers intact from the missile. 
17% is when you calculate it based on the prayers are totally intact. Just took a prayer from the old mass, put it in the new, 17%. 40% is when you calculate it based on you took a prayer from the old mass, you took out the word sin, and you put it in the new mass. So the, the collect for the holy innocence, December 28, they took the collect for the holy innocence, they took out the term mortification, and then they put it in the new mass. That's literally what they did. So you can get you can actually get to 40% if you calculate it that way. But otherwise, it, it's just been excised. They just took out all these things, ripped them all out. So so Paul VI, after this mass, he's reading through the text because he didn't read through the whole the whole missile. We also know this. Paul VI did not read the, through the whole missal before he approved it. So he's reading through the whole mass and he says, and, and he's talking to Louis Bouillet. This is recounted in his biography, The Memoirs of Louis Bouillet. You can buy it by Angelical Press. Paul VI is reading through the Mass, and he says he says to Louis Bouillet, why did you do X, Y, Z in the Mass? And Louis Bouillet says, well, Holy Father, because you requested that. And then Paul says, whoa, whoa. He's like, I never requested that. And then Louis Bouillet says, uh, well, Bounini said you did. And then that's when they realized what Bounini had done. And that's how he implemented his reforms. And this was the beginning of Paul VI losing his confidence in Bunini, which eventually, as we said, came to 1975, where he totally sacked him, sent him to Iran, and and and, invest, and instigated a massive investigation of the Curia, mm -hmm. which was taken, which was done by Cardinal Gagnon, who was uh, later investigating Lefebvre, mm -hmm. and he found out in 1977 that the uh, they they were living in a third pornocracy is, is the term that I use, uh, which was what we live in today. So they knew about this back in 77, that the Curia, the Vatican Bank, everybody was totally corrupt. And what's interesting is that Joseph Ratzinger, who was a famous priest theologian, going back to 1961, he was famous. He was very famous. Everybody knew about him. He had publicly critiqued the new mass and its implementation. In fact, let me just read this because we need to just read this quote over and over. So if you read Milestones by Joseph Ratzinger, and here's where we talk about hermeneutic of rupture. Here's what Ratzinger says on page 147, 146 and following. Um, the Missal of Paul VI was accompanied by the almost total prohibition of using the Missal we had had until then. I was dismayed by the prohibition of the old missile, since nothing of the sort had ever happened in the entire history of the liturgy. He goes on. The prohibition of the missile that was now decreed, so key point here, Paul VI very clearly intended to abrogate the old mass with what he did. He says in one address, this is a law. And that's why the Latin mass was called an indult mass, because an indult, by definition, is an exception to a universal law. So going on, Retziger says this, the prohibition of the missile that was now decreed, a missile that had known continuous growth over centuries, introduced a breach into the history of the liturgy whose consequences could only be tragic. Yeah. And this is what Ratzinger was saying publicly in, 19, in the 1970s. Yeah. Yep. So, so he was a critic. He was a public critic of Paul VI. He was a famous priest, theologian. And what happens in 1977? During Paul, Paul VI is 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 reeling everything in. He sacks Bunini. He investigates the Curia. He he's trying to clamp down on communion in the hand. He's trying to stop it. Yeah. He makes Ratzinger bishop. 1977. I think this is actually a mea culpa moment for Paul VI. He's he says, I need to. I'm going to actually make him a bishop. Because I think that I, what I've what I've done with Bunini, we need to do something to try to correct it, try to reverse something. Ratziger he makes his own bishop his critic, and so right. this. But then he dies, so he's about to die. So he, it's at the end of his life. He, he's he has limited time to even do anything. So he makes Ratziger the bishop, and eventually John Paul II brings uh, quickly elevates him to the position of the CDF. He's only three years a bishop. He, he gets headed, he gets all the way up to the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, Holy F Office, in three years. So he's immediately promoted all the way to the highest post in the Vatican on doctrine. Um, so this is, so I, I want to get to these other quotes from Ratzinger. So in 2000, 
he writes the spirit of the liturgy, which is, um, which is he, um, we don't have time to go into all of Ratzinger's work in the liturgy, but essentially his big moment is when he defends Klaus Gamber. So Klaus Gamber was a German scholar who critiqued the Novus Ordo in and of itself. He critiqued the Novus Ordo Misae as a betrayal of Vatican II. He said, this is a betrayal of Vatican II, uh, the texts and the rubrics, not the abuses. He's talking about the texts the and the rubrics. Thing Novus Ordo. Yes, yeah. Klaus Gamber said this. Ratzinger defended him. He said, and he, he, this is when he calls the, the new mass a banal fabrication. Mm -hmm. and a production so in 2000 he ratziger published is the spirit of the liturgy and he says this page 171 second vatican council gave us the phrase active participation and defined the liturgy as the action of uh, christ unfortunately the word active participation very quickly was misunderstood to mean something external entailing a need for general activity as if as many people as possible as often as possible to be visibly engaged in action that's exactly what's happened in the Novus Ordo. And then he says in 173, Ratzinger, this action of God, which takes place through human speech, is the real action for which all creation is expectation. So he's, this, is, this is what we're saying. Here's the quote. The real action in the liturgy in which we are all supposed to participate is the action of God himself. The whole event of the incarnation, cross, resurrection, and the second coming is present as the way by which God draws man into cooperation with himself. Uh, and then he's, he goes on and talks about the sacrifice. The sacrifice of the Logos is accepted already and forever, but we must still pray for it to become our sacrifice, that we ourselves, as we said, must be transformed into the Logos, conformed to the Logos, so be made the true body of Christ. There is only one action, which is at the same time his and ours. Ours because we have become one body and one spirit with him, Christ, the uniqueness of the Eucharistic liturgy lies precisely in the fact that God himself is acting and that we are drawn into that action of God. Everything else, therefore, is secondary. Everything else is secondary be, uh, to God's own action. Yep. We don't participate in that. Yeah, and one thing that struck me a couple minutes ago, uh, the new mass-oriented mentality the Nova Sordo mentality, let's call it that. It really is a different paradigm. This is a whole other thing. Actually, Steve Skojak, controversy aside from all the things online, he wrote an article three years ago or so, which was actually quite good. I think he called it the Nova Sordo paradigm and sort of it was a little paradigm shift. It's like a different church in a sense, which I know sounds, people are starting to say things like that. It sounds all, sounding all Lefebvreist. Um, but the, the new paradigm, people love to talk about the living magisterium. They love to talk about the living, all these terms they love to use. I agree. So for something to be living, it has to retain its roots, otherwise it dies. So the, the old mass is a living mass in the sense that there are growths that happen the same way that there are f new flowerings and pruning and 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 yields of, of, of growth on a vine. You know, this is why we have to go back to the the, the vocabulary that Christ gives us. And so, yes, over time, the life cycle of your crops, <laughs> uh, you have to prune things and you have to uh, maybe graft things on, et cetera, but you can't do things that take away the actual, the, the roots. You can't have a radical change, go up the radix. You can't actually change it because it will wither away and die. If you do things too quickly, uh, if you don't have the right uh, soil, I mean, follow the analogy out all the way. If you understand anything, it's a very delicate procedure that has to happen. And you have to observe and say, okay, where is there growth? Good. Keep that going. Where is there something that's leading to uh, damage? Okay. Prune that back a little bit. But it has to be very slow. It has to be very gradual. And it has to take place um, in conjunction with how the thing is supposed to to live. That's what the old mass has done. There's nothing wrong with there being, uh, you know, so people will talk about quo primum. Um, I have heard Ryan Grant, for example, uh, it's his opinion reading, and he's read everything, let's be honest. <laughs> he's read a lot of things. He says quo primum is not infallible. Uh, infallible is a pretty high bar. But at the same time, I've also heard uh, scholars uh, at the Kwasniewski level of scholar, et cetera, and just really good priests saying, well, if it's not infallible, that doesn't mean it can be ignored, you know, because Quo Primum represents the spirit of how the liturgy ought to be looked at. Maybe we'll go into Quo Primum more in our next episode on this or something, because there's a lot in that document, which applies to what we're doing. But 
Um, there's a great series by Father Ripperger on tradition. And one of the things that is lost in the new the new paradigm is the understanding of monuments. So uh, anything that can be added, sorry, anything that can be changed is an addition, not a subtraction in, in a substantial sense. So uh, you understand what a monument is in your life. A monument is something that you add to commemorate something. Okay. So just naturally speaking, we have a cenotaph. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. We binding have, force of tradition. Yes. Essential reading. It's only 50 pages. Go buy it now. Exactly. And there's a wonderful lecture series. Uh, I think on his web census traditionist, whatever it's, it's, you can find it on sense of Fidelian, but he also has a website for father Ripperger and you can listen to just audio files. It's great. Um, and I basically, he talks about what's in that. It's, it's almost just a, it's a, it's a conference series that he's explaining his ideas in there. So if you're, if you're driving, you want to do it, listen to that as well. And, you know, we have a cenotaph here in, in, in town about World War One. Okay. Actually, it was designed by the same man who designed the uh, monument at Vimy Ridge. The Canada had a big participation in Vimy Ridge in World War One. In yeah. any case, a um, friend of mine a couple of years ago, she was a principal, and um, she saw some kids skateboarding on the cenotaph. And she went down and stopped them. Not that she's anti-skateboarding, not that whatever, but this is not what you're supposed to do to this thing. This is a monument to the dead. It's a sacred, it's a, it's a sacred, secularly sacred place. It makes sense. So if anyone was ever go down there uh, and take a sledgehammer and destroy it, whether you believe the Canadians and British or whatever were correct, or that's not the point. The point is, this is a monument. You can't destroy it. That's your, that should be your natural, rev, uh, your, your uh, protestation against destroying something that's a monument. Um, now you could add to it. You could say over time, this monument weathered, etc. We're going to rebuild it and then some. You could do that, but you can't take away from what was laid down before you. That's that's a uh, it's a sin against piety. It's a it's a it's iconoclasm. Like yeah, it's a iconoclasm. Yes, it's a, but it's also just from a basic level. It's it's rude. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. And um, so with the liturgy, you can add to it. You can you can say here's the monument. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make this better by keeping what was there and adding things that bring out the fruits of what was planted in a way that makes it more obvious what they were trying to transmit to us. The old mass can do that a thousand years from now, if we're still, if, if Christ hasn't come back, uh, we could still, we could see a liturgy that could have, if you, if you were to look at the liturgy of 1962 versus liturgy of, uh, 21 or whatever. 21062, whatever the year would be, a thousand years from now. Um, you could look at that, and it could be, in some sense, very different, maybe in, on a surface level, sort of, but organically, it would be um, building upon the monuments, so nothing substantial would be taken away. So when you have something where really you're only retaining 17%, you stretch it out, you're retaining 40%, that's clearly the antithesis of, again, Novus Ordo people, living magisterium, living tradition. A living tradition would not only retain 17%, because if you retain 17%, you die. So there's that's sort of what that means. Yeah, and this is exactly what Ratzinger is saying in the quote I just read from Milestones. We, we cannot abolish. In fact, let me read this other quote here from, um, this is, so this is another, this perhaps is even more critical with the most recent mode proprio. So this is from the address, uh, where is this? Okay, so this is the 10th anniversary of Ecclesia Dei Afflicta. So just so you know, uh, if you want to understand Ratzinger, you need to buy this. We're in German. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you want to buy this text, which is Joseph Ratzinger Collected Works, Theology of the Liturgy. But there are two critical works left out of this compilation, and I've linked them below, and one of them is this address. Uh, so this is on the 10th anniversary of De Ecclesia Dei Afflicta, 1998. Mm. He says this, <clears throat> Ratzinger. It is good to recall here what Cardinal Newman observed, that the church throughout her history has never abolished nor forbidden orthodox liturgical forms, which would be quite alien to the spirit of the church. And why would it be quite alien? Well, because the seventh ecumenical council in the year 787 included this anathema. Whoever rejects any unwritten or written tradition of the church, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. And this is because people were destroying images at the time. Yes, yeah, I was, was just going to say that. It was the first iconoclasm when they were destroying images. And as you just pointed out, Kennedy, these are the monuments of our fathers. It is it is gross impiety to destroy a monument of our fathers, whether that's a, an actual building 
a built built monument, a statue, an image, or whatever, or that's a, a writing of our fathers, or that's a custom of our fathers, or anything that our fathers passed down to us, it is a grave impiety. Mm -hmm. Whoever rejects an unwritten or written tradition of the church, let him be anathema. Mm -hmm. That's why Ratzinger is repeating the exact same thing. The church has never abolished. That's that this is quite alien to the spirit of the church. So the question is, does the Pope have the authority to do something that's quite alien to the spirit of the church? We'll talk about that in the second shows. But first, I want to talk about, uh, let's see. So this is, I want to re re read these quotes from Ratzinger from the, the collected works, and then we can close out here. And this is from an address he gave in 2001 after he published um, the, um, the Spirit of the Liturgy. And this is going to go right back to what we quoted from Trent. And he says this. This is from page 544 on Collected Works. Uh, here's Rassinger talking. A, a sizable party of Catholic liturgies, liturgists seem to have arrived in practice at the conclusion that Luther, rather than Trent, was substantially right in the 16th century debate. One can detect much the same position in the post-conciliar discussion on the priesthood. So basically, he's he's, he's sounding all schismaticy there. What's wrong with him? Oh yeah, he, he's he's uh, the Rassinger is making note that all these Catholic theologians, so called, are so ashamed of their Catholicism and they're they're they they really want to be more Protestant because mm -hmm. Luther was right about the mass. Mass is not a sacrifice. Uh, he quotes an, uh, uh, he quotes the uh, he quotes Stefan Orth, who's some Catholic theologians so-called as saying this many catholics themselves today ratify the verdict that the conclusion of martin luther who says that the speak of the sacrifice is the greatest and most appalling horror and a damnable idolatry this is why we want to refrain from all that smacks of sacrifice including the whole canon and retain only that was that which is pure and holy remember what trent just said about the canon in the beginning of our episode <laughs> let him be anathema so this catholic is anathematizing himself because he's saying we should take away the whole canon because it's so sacrificial. So Ratzinger is, is critiquing all this, and this is what he says. So he says this is, you know, he discusses all this. And then he says this. Here's the key right now for us. Page 544, Ratzinger talking. Only against this background of the effective denial of the authority of Trent, so all these Catholics are ashamed of Trent, can yeah. one understand the bitterness and the struggle against allowing the celebration of mass according to the 1962 missile. So he's like, this is why they hate the Latin mass because they hate being Catholic. <laughs> Would you ever notice as well that um, officially speaking, it's very hard to find a place where a prelate, unless he's traditional minded, will call it the Tridentine liturgy. You know, it's the Usus Antiquior or it's the extraordinary form because it's almost as if you don't want to name the council of Trent because that's the kryptonite for modernism. Uh, whereas uh, amongst traditional circles, you call it the Tridentine mass. You know, what is it? It's the mass of Trent. That's what it is, which, and read quo primum again, quo primum represents so-called living magisterium. They're recognizing that the mass that they're giving you, uh, that St. Pius V is, is, is canonizing is a reform in and of itself. That's what that missile is. Uh, so when he says, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, this, this mass, no one can ever use a different mass. What he's referring to is the substantial essential part of the mass, because clearly he's demonstrating by the document itself, that mass, the mass, the missile can be reformed, but the mass itself cannot change. And he's also recognizing that, um, literally says anything that's older than 200 years, we're good to go because, and this is something also that uh, uh, Father Ripperger talks about, is that you want to know what the holy, the will of the Holy Ghost is, you have to look at longevity. You know, I did a talk years ago to young kids, and it was, how can I recognize what my vocation is? And these kids, honestly, well-intentioned, well, well -intentioned, but very charismatic, and they're like, when's the, you know, billboard going to show up that God places in front of me to tell me which career path to do? And I said, hold on a sec. Um, are, is, is it holy? Are you good at it? Have you prayed about it? like it was very simple it's like you're either going to get married or you go into a religious life if you're going to get married you better go into something that that um uh works for your vocation not against it so are you good at science do you like helping people or uh, do you have the means to go to medical school maybe you should be i mean it's really that simple to figure out what you're supposed to do it's you can be very practical about it 
Well, if you want to practically understand what the will of the Holy Ghost is in the church, it's not something where you have to see feathers falling from the sky and writing you a message on the sidewalk. It's, yeah. um, when was there heresy? Okay, what beat that heresy? Well, that seems pretty good. Uh, what happened for 1,800 years? Um, and, and how did Catholics get to heaven? Probably the will of the Holy Ghost. What works against that? Well, God doesn't just change his mind like that and say, well, we should fundamentally alter the church. That is against the will of the Holy Ghost, not because you have to be some mystic to understand it, because it simply just doesn't work. So whatever's been happening for the last 50 or 60 years, it just simply doesn't work and less Catholics are saved than ought to be. Very simple. The will of the Holy Ghost is that you don't be damned, fundamentally. Uh, against that is obviously not the Holy Ghost's will. You have your free will and so forth, but that's makes that easily understood. The liturgy. The will of the Holy Ghost is that, uh, liturgically speaking, the monuments are kept, so on and so forth. We build upon the foundation that was, you know, that on the rock that we've been giving. If something works against that, again, God doesn't just arbitrarily change his mind. Yeah, totally. Uh, that, that's exactly right. That the, the principle of tradition. That's that's and that's that's what I will get into maybe the next show, this show after is the the binding force of tradition, and that's the other aspect because we're and we're friend. starting with. We're starting with the fundamental aspect of the worship of God of all else as yeah. the definition of liturgy. But then that that begs the question, well, then how do we worship God? Mm -hmm. And then that's where we go to tradition. What were you going to say? Well, I would say I'll, I'll put, give you maybe to put in the chat a really good uh, talk on the liturgy by Father Franks, who teaches at St. Mary's Academy. He's a priest in the SSPX. It's a, he's a very interesting story. He's got a wonderful conversion story, just as a side note. He was... Uh, he grew up in England, sort of nominal Catholic, sort of atheistic, you know, revolutionary thinking kid as a teenager, as many do, sort of read himself into Catholicism and then became a traditional priest. Uh, he's really, really smart. He's one of those guys where just, he's clearly a genius, but also a priest, you know, he's academically one of those. And he has a really great talk on the liturgy. Um, and in a very Ratzingerian way, uses language where it really makes you understand everything from the philosophy to the psychology to the theology. And you go, ah, it's like the, it, the, the mass itself corrects my very existence. There's almost a cosmological reality where you recognize uh, affronts against sins against the created order and things can only be fixed by something that is cosmological in its significance, i.e. the sustenance of the universe through the active power of God, which is why, um, Padre Pio tells us like literally it would be easier for the world to exist without the sun in the sky than it is without the mass. It's not just something that's for our, uh, aesthetic benefit. It's something that, uh, in a sense sustains existence and being itself. And therefore the mass itself better be pretty precise on that. Um, and father Franks does a wonderful job explaining that. Um, also we, we had to go here in a sec, but, um, we'll talk about how, okay. Ratzinger has all these wonderful quotes. He's obviously a very intelligent man. Um, how is there such a difference in application? And then we'll talk about the difference between Lefebvre, the missionary, with the urgency for souls under his care, which his whole life set him up for. Thanks be to God, Lefebvre was only a bishop in Europe for a couple of years. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he was, you know, which makes sense because Europe is already colonized. Europe's already Catholic in that sense. You almost can get complacent. You shouldn't, but you could. Whereas uh, Benedict, yes, he was a priest, but very much becomes a theologian intellectual. His bishopric is almost uh, a promotion, let's say, for a higher job. And he sort of lives his life as a professor and theologian and perhaps yeah. might lose that urgency for souls under his care. Yeah, so we'll definitely talk about more about these aspects. I wanted to just end with <clears throat> end with this final quote here. So he's, so Ratziger is saying that the reason they hate the Latin mass is because they hate Trent. They hate the theology of the Trent and they, they hate the theology of sacrifice. They, this, that what we're talking about, this fundamental principle of what the liturgy is. And Ratzinger goes on, the possibility of so celebrating the Latin mass constitutes the strongest and thus for them, the most intolerable contradiction of the opinion of those who believe that the faith in the Eucharist formulated at Trent has lost its validity. So they don't want the Latin mass because they don't want the Tridentine dogmas about the liturgy and the Eucharist. And then he goes on and defends Trent and, and, and deepens Trent. And, and he talks for a while in this address about why Trent is correct. And he concludes says Trent is not mistaken. It stood on the firm foundation of the church of tradition. Yeah. It remains a reliable standard, but we can and must understand it in a new, more profound way, drawing on the fullness of the biblical testimony and the faith of the church of all times. Now, this is where we get into the controversy with Lefebvre because he is then talking about the Paschal mystery, 
in the not only the death of Christ, but also the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, and all of this within within the the scriptural theology. So we're going to get into that in the future. But he, he concludes with this. This is Ratzinger, page 557. One thing should be clear. The liturgy must not be an experimental field for studying theological hypotheses. Too rapidly in recent decades, views of experts have been put into liturgical practice, to a great extent even bypassing ecclesiastical authority. By way of committees that knew how to spread their consensus of the day internationally, and practically speaking, to turn it into laws for liturgical activity. Now, notice what he's saying. He's using very pre precise language. He's saying that it actually did make it into the Novus Ordo Mise, in addition to the abuses. He said, to a great extent, even by best. So that means he's he is saying that the Novus Ordo Mise, in and of itself, in the rubrics and text of the Novus Ordo Mise, there is this overemphasis on experts, and then there's also abuses. The liturgy derives its greatness from what it is, not from what we do with it. Of course, it is necessary for us to do something, but only by humbly complying with the spirit of the liturgy and serving him who is the true subject of the liturgy, Jesus Christ. The liturgy is not an expression of the community's consciousness, which is, which in any case is diffuse and changing. It is a revelation received in faith and prayer, and hence its standard of the church's faith which is a vessel of revelation. And that is the key point that we can cover in our next show, which is the binding force of tradition. What is the relationship of the liturgy to revelation, to the deposit of faith, quo primum and all this. So this-, this And is I, just put, I just put in the chat the, oh, you yes. put in the okay. comments. Yeah, so- It's called, it's called yeah. why I would literally, would rather literally die than offer the new mass. People, whoa, but again, once you understand the significance of the liturgy, what's being done, why it's being done, what it means in the context of the history of the church. Uh, our f ancestors in England that were lay people would said that they actually would literally die rather than even attend Cramner's new liturgy, which has striking similarities to the Novus Ordo. So um, it's not just, he jokes in the video about this is, we need to put titles that people like on YouTube. That's part of it. <laughs> um, but he means what he says, and it's a very informative and, 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 and thoughtful talk my last thing I'll say, my little SSPX soapbox, one of the reasons why I like the SSPX, I actually believe there's lots of balance there because uh, they don't exist. They exist in continuity with what always existed. It's It was an order that started the right way before things happen. Um, so sometimes, you know, around Holy Week, people are like, oh, you're not traditional unless you're doing the pre-55 Holy Week. Well, listen, pre-55 Holy Week is probably... Uh, more legitimate, let's say, and more more effective and traditional, but but um, it's not really a controversy in the SSPX. It's kind of like, well, we were we're handing on what was given to us legitimately at the time, and we're just sort of continuing with that. Um, so listen to this good priest talk, because you'll see there a really excellent formation philosophically and theologically, and I think it's very helpful. Excellent. Well, so check out the uh, Kennedy Profession this yes. week on the Crusade Channel. Hopefully, Kennedy will also give us some some tastes of that on uh, meaning of Catholic mm -hmm. and uh, check out the liturgy.org. Please go to the liturgy.org, donate, promote the documentary. This is going to be big, really excited about this. So let's offer up in our father for always that our offering of the mass may be acceptable and pleasing to the Lord that, that his, his own sacrifice, our sacrifice, at the mass of our own selves in union with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross may be acceptable on the day of judgment. In nomine Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Jadis, Sancti Vegeto Nomen Tuum, Adveniat Regnum Tuum, Fia Voluntas Tua, Sicut in Cielo, et in Terra. Panem Nostrum Quotidianum Dando Bisodie, Dimitri Nobis Debita Nostra, Sicut et Nostri Vitimus Debitoribus Nostris, Ne Nos in Ducas in Tentationem Seti Vere Nos Amalo, Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.